Great, thank you. So I will start off with paying my respects to the traditional and original owners of the land, this land Muvini, of the Muvinina people, to pay respect to those that have passed before us and to acknowledge today's Tasmanian Aboriginal people who are the custodians of this land. Yeah. Oh, great. Thanks, Georgie, for letting people in. <laughs> um, Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nivi. I'm the Global Education Marketing Officer for Study Tasmania. Study Tasmania is a study body for the Tasmanian government, um, and we do everything. We, we take care of everything to do with international education for the Tasmanian government. Uh, a big part of what we do, actually, the, everything what we do can be divided into two things. One is to, of course, to encourage more international students from around the world to consider Tasmania as their ideal study destination because we have world class facilities, we have um, a great environment, we have um, a safe and welcoming communities in Tasmania that um, cherish the international student cohort. We like to celebrate them, we like to have them included in the society and our community and in the economy as well. Um, so that's part of a, a job. And also um, a big chunk of what I do personally uh, in my role is to also give a lot of support and well-being activities and events and initiatives for international students who are already in Tasmania. Um, and we also do a lot of employability enhancing training and initiatives for the students. And the Tasmanian industry webinar series is a part of that. Uh, previously, we've done webinars where experts from different industries that are very popular among the international student cohort join us in these webinars and they talk to you directly about what makes you more employable in the field of your choice. Previously, we've had experts from industries like pharmacy, nursing and allied health, disability and aged care, community services, accounting, tourism and hospitality, um, and so much more um, who have who have done these webinar series. So if you have any friends from these different fields who are interested to become employable, who are in that right stage right now to actually um, know more, have, have more information, please direct them to our website and they can go through the previous webinar recordings there as well. So today with us, we have George Georgie Brown, who is the chair of TAS ICT Workforce Development Subcommittee. Georgie will be presenting about career outcomes, what kind of jobs to look out for, um, skills that employers are looking for, and much more to help you international students to enhance your employability in the Tasmanian ICT industry. So over to you. Um, so before I go on to Georgie, just a bit of housekeeping before that. Uh, so Georgie will be presenting for, say, maybe 20 15 to 20 maybe 30 minutes and after that uh, we'll open up the floor for questions um right now all your mics are muted um so when it when the time comes i can unmute them if you want to just raise your hand there's a raise your hand function somewhere up top so if you can choose that then i can unmute your mic or if you just like to pop in your questions while georgie is presenting um in the chat box then i can triage through them and ask those questions to georgie so over to you georgie please could you please in, give a um, bit more uh, information about yourself and uh, yeah, we can go ahead with the presentation. Sure, Nivi. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for inviting me today and thank you um, to all of your students for coming along and, and um, listening as well. I'm really excited to share um, some tips and ideas that I've got. The purpose of today is to really share practical tips with you um, and the main things that I'm going to focus on are resume pre preparation and um, interview skills as well. So I'll just share my screen with you so you can see my presentation here. So um, getting started for career success. Um, so today, like I said, the purpose of today is to really give you some practical tips on resume preparation. So looking at resume statistics that you need to know, um, how to write a resume that gets you noticed for the right reasons, how to set yourself up for interview success, how to nail your interview and get the job that you want, as well as questions and answers, and really you know, keen to, to open that up to any questions and answers you've got to ask me today. So um, as Nivi, Nivi mentioned, I'm Georgie Brown. Um, I'm, I sit on the IC, TAS ICT board, um, I'm a board member and I'm also the chair of the Workforce Planning Committee for TAS ICT. 
Um, I'm an IT recruitment specialist, so I've worked um, in IT recruitment for about 20 years. I'm currently Managing Director of Red Apple IT. We're an Australian IT recruitment consultancy. We're based in Tasmania, but we service clients all over Australia. So um, we're really experts in assessing and attracting talent within the IT recruitment space. Um, we've been doing it for a really long time. We love what we do and we know what works um, and how to set people up to get their dream job. So the first thing I really want to focus on is resumes. Obviously, to get your dream job, you need to apply with a resume and you also need to make sure that you're successful in an interview. So first of all, let's focus on resumes. So resumes are a critical tool in your applicant toolbox. Everyone has to have one. Your resume is often the first thing that a business will see of you. Having a resume that allows you to stand out for the right reasons will set you up to secure an interview. So that's just getting you to the next stage. So let's find out what you need to know about resumes. So first of all, we'd normally be doing this kind of in a face-to-face um, -face environment, but I just want you to answer this yourself and have a think about this. So um, question one, your resume should be two pages maximum. That's correct. Okay, so when you're starting out in your career as a graduate, um, you know, trying to get into your first or maybe your second job, your resume should be no more than two pages long. As your career progresses and you develop your skills and, and your work experience, then your resume can be up to four pages in length, but you should really never have any more than four pages. You know, as a, as a recruitment consultant, I might get um, 120 people apply for one job that I've advertised. And so it's really key that I quickly assess those candidates and, you know, it, it's those people that stand out and have the right the right information on their resume that is going to get noticed. So if you've got a 17 or a 20 page resume, um, you're going to be wasting the people's time that, that that's reading that resume. Question two, so you have 60 seconds to make an impact with your resume to get a further review. What do you think, true or false? Just think in your head, true or false? 60 seconds, incorrect. <laughs> You have six seconds to make an impact. That's right, six seconds when someone is reading your resume. So if your resume is not presented in a logical, methodical manner, um, and if I've got, you know, 120 resumes to go through that in those couple of hours, um, you know, you really need to make sure um, the right information stands out straight away. Question three. Your resume is your marketing document. True or false, think, is it your marketing document? Yes, it is. So your resume is like your sales and marketing brochure and, and similarly is your LinkedIn profile. It needs to capture the attention of the reader quickly and in a professional and appealing way to get you an interview. Question four. You should include your photograph on your resume so the reader knows what you look like. True or false? The answer is incorrect, false. Unless you're going for an acting or a modelling job, it is not relevant what you look like, okay? And I think as well, it sometimes opens up, opens you up to unconscious bias, putting your, your, your um, your, your photo on there, um, you know, ageism, sexism, all that kind of thing. So I just think it's best to leave it off. Next question, question five. You should leave off any curricular activities you did at school and university from your resume. True or false? Incorrect. When you're starting off your career, you should include all relevant information that makes you an all-rounder. Employers are looking for junior talent, um, 
who are interested in all different things and all those different things that you can bring to a role. So you should absolutely include, because you don't have a long work experience, you should absolutely include your extracurricular activities. Okay, so now we're going to look at what are the things that an employer is interested in when they're looking at your resume. So these things are critical to make sure that they're included in your resume. First of all, the results. So your school and your university results, probably just your university results, but if you've got any outstanding results from school, you might want to include those as well. Your work experience. That can include paid and unpaid work experience. So it doesn't necessarily have to be paid work only. Um, any experience that you're bringing as a graduate um, into a new position is valuable for that employer. So it's, it's key that you include it. Any leadership experience that you might have. So that might be something like you might have been, um, you know, always the leader in university projects. You might have been the captain of your hockey team at school. You might have been a team leader at McDonald's. Um, or you might have been a dance teacher when you were younger. Um, whatever it is, if you've had any leadership experience, you should you should you know include it. It shows maturity. Even I remember I used to even have on my resume that I had babysitting experience because you know if someone's um, going to put me in charge of their children for the night, then I'm probably fairly responsible. <laughs> Extracurricular activities as well, okay, and we spoke about that in the last slide, so definitely include any extracurricular activities you might have had. These are your resume headings, so these are the things that, that should be included in your resume. So your summary, and I really suggest that you don't, you know, your summary doesn't need to be half a page long. Your, your summary probably needs to be two to three sentences long. Um, it might talk a little bit about, you know, what you've done in the past and what you want to do in the future. So why you did the university degree you did um, and, and, you know, and area, areas of interest that you, you're keen to get into in the future. But also make sure that if you're applying to a job that your resume is um, tailored to that job. So if you're if you're going for a job in cybersecurity, you don't want to say in your summary that you're interested in development jobs only because you're applying for a cyber role. So just be conscious that that reflects to the job that you're applying for. Your skills and your strengths. And sometimes uh, what I see a lot at, with graduates is that they come up with the same strengths and the same skills. So often it's the same skills and strengths on resumes over and over. Often when I'm asking um, a graduate in an interview, tell me, you know, tell me three words that describe your personality. So describe your strengths. They come up with the three same words every time. So they say they're hardworking, they're committed or loyal, and they're reliable. That's not going to make you stand out from the crowd if you're saying those things, okay? You really need to think about your strengths, what you personally bring to a, a role, um, and talk about that. So if you've had a lot of experience in customer service, you talk about customer service. If you've had no experience in customer service, don't put customer service on your resume. If you're unsure of what to put for this Part because you're not really sure of what your strengths are. There's a really great online test that you can do called 16 Personalities. So if you go to 16personalities.com, there's a 10 minute personality test that you can do and it's insanely accurate. So you can go on there and fill out your person and answer correctly, answer truthfully, answer really how you feel. And then it will often it'll throw you back a snapshot of what your strengths are. Have a read through that and see if they ring true with you. If they ring true, include them in your resume. We want to make sure that our resume is a true and authentic reflection of who we are. And if it is an, a true and authentic reflection of who we are, as opposed to a cookie cutter, what we expect to put on a resume like hardworking, 
reliable, trustworthy, all these words that have been overused, they don't ring true and they don't hold any weight with the person that's reading your resume. So that's just a, a really clever way to go and have a look if you're unsure of what to put as your strengths and your skills, go and check out 16personalities.com and that might give you some ideas. Obviously include your, your education um, and your scores, your professional experience and as I said, any and you can break that up into any paid and unpaid. Um, your leadership experience, your extracurricular activities, any volunteering experience and then also your references. And it's perfectly to say, fine to say at the bottom of a resume, references will be provided upon request. The reason I say that is that you don't necessarily want to share your referees details on a resume that you're sending out to every single company and every single recruiter and every everyone in town. Um, you know, it's really important that we think about security as well. We don't want to necessarily put, um, you know, our uh, the people that are going to give us references, their contact details on a on a resume where anyone can just contact them out of the blue. You also want to control um, and let those references know if and when they should expect to call. So that's a way to allow the hiring manager or the recruiter or whoever you're working with to call you first to alert you that they're going to call you references. Can you tell me, you know, the contact details of those people? Okay, so just to recap, resume tips, use a well-structured template. Check for spelling and grammar. It's incredible how many spelling mistakes I find in resumes. And also, I, I find that if you're reading the same document over and over, often you don't pick it up, okay? So it's really important to speak your resume out loud once you've completed it so that it completely makes sense. Because if you've written... I don't know, his instead of is, it won't come up on a spelling or a grammar, grammar check necessarily. Your correct contact details, and please make sure that they're in the top left or the top right hand corner of the document. Often you find them at the very bottom of a resume, um, and it's just easier for the people that are reading them. If they're at the top, they're easier to find. Combine your hard skills and your soft skills. Use a readable font. Um, it's really important as well that you don't put colour into your resume. I mean, my experience is that just use size 11 Calabri or Arial or Times New, Room, New Roman. Um, if you have lots of colour in your font and you might have the headings a different colour than the bulk of your resume, if someone's printing off your resume to interview you and they're printer doesn't necessarily have the best toner. It's really hard to see some of the text. It, a lot of people put their resumes in a light gray color. And when you print it off on a, on a, on a printer, you can't, you can't read it. So just to fix that. Um, also, some people might have not so great eyesight. Um, so to fix that, make sure you're using a readable font and it's all black. You can possibly bold your headings or make your headings slightly larger font um, just so that they're easy to find. Make sure you create a matching cover letter. Um, it's also really important if you're going to use a cover letter, make sure it matches the job that you're applying for. Don't just use a standard generic one every time. If someone's put their name, like if, if, if candidates need to apply to joeblogs at government.com.au, use that name to address your cover letter you know so if it, you know i put in my ads contact it'll be either myself georgie brown or my colleagues don st pierre and matthew warner the candidates that apply addressing me personally um, already stand out because i know that they've read the whole document per perfectly the information's there so use it um, if the information's not there um, I would avoid using dear sir and madame. I would address it to the hiring manager. Um, you know, to the hiring manager is a lot, um, it's a nicer, dear sir, madame is very formal and it's and it's a bit dated nowadays. Um, 
give a holistic view of you, no more than two pages, and use a really professional email address. So if you have a personal email address that is chickybabe666 at hotmail.com, I would change that to apply for jobs, okay? You need to have, make sure that you're using a professional email address that's your name or something that's else that's professional. Okay, now we're going to focus on interviewing. So you've applied for the job, you've, submit, you've submitted your amazing resume of two pages maximum, and they're really keen to meet with you. So they've rung you and they've organised or they've emailed you and organised an interview. If you can avoid a lot of these things, um, there's a lot of non-verbal mistakes that are made within a job interview. So if you can avoid these things, you will already be ahead of your competition. It's highly competitive in the graduate space to secure work, as I'm sure you're all aware. 21% of people play with their hair or touch their face. And, you know, that's a distraction for the person that's interviewing them. 47% have little or no knowledge of the company. That's a really easy one to fix, right? Do your research beforehand. Um, find out about the company. Find out about what challenges they might have at the moment. Find out about what's important to them. Find out about what their values are. And you can typically find that off their, their um, website. 67% failure to make eye contact. And this can be a really hard one for a lot of people. Um, it's really integral in an interview situation that you try as best as you can to make eye contact. Um, a lack of smile, 38%. This is critical, I think, as well over online interviews, which is obviously something that is more prominent since COVID. So a lot of people get nervous and are focused, and so they don't smile. Um, if you smile in an interview, the person will automatically smile back at you. And it's just a really good way of showing positive body language, particularly over a Zoom or a, a Teams call, which a lot of the interviews will be that these days. 33% bad posture, 21% crossing their arms over their chest, 9% too many using too many hand gestures, 26% a handshake that's too weak. 33% fidgeting too, too much. Okay, so in a survey done of 2,000 bosses, 33% claim that they know within the first 90 seconds of an interview whether they'll hire someone. So bright clothes, bright colours are a turn off in an interview. 77% 70 of people of, of hiring managers don't want applicants to be fashionable or trendy. And 65% said clothes could be the deciding factor between two similar candidates. Okay, the average length of an interview is about 40 minutes, just so you know, approximately. Some go for shorter, some go a little bit longer. I don't know why that's not working now. There we go. Well, let's go to this one. So positive first impressions. It is really critical that you make a positive first impression. And most of the interview is based on the first impression. And we can talk about that. So 7% of the impression that you give is from what you actually say, which I think is an incredible stat, right? It's not about what you're saying. 38% of it is based on the quality of our voice, the grammar, and our overall confidence. And 55% is the way that we dress, the way that we act, and the way that we walk through the door. So if you can walk through the door with a big smile on your face, have a firm um, handshake or a, or a elbow bump, if that's what we're doing at the moment, um, and be dressed in corporate attire, you know, you're going to nail 55% 50, 50, of your first impression. You're already halfway, over halfway there. Um, and likewise, with a Zoom or, or an online call, I would say it's, again, about the way we dress. Do we have a smile on our face when, when we're being spoken to and, you know, when we're introducing each other? Um, 
Are we on time? It's really critical on a Zoom call. I would almost say be early and wait for them. It's always better that you're waiting for them than they're waiting for you. What to wear to your interview. So here's just some examples of what corporate Australia expects people to wear to an interview situation. Once you're in a job, it's a bit different and people tend to then show their personalities. Um, but in an interview, it's really advisable that you go out and, you, you know, you buy either a navy blue, a dark grey um, or a black suit. Maybe I think there's some people there in the... Yeah. Sorry for me, keep moving around this little screen, but the seven P's. Preparation is paramount. Proper preparation promises perfect performances. And this this is great advice. Prepare, prepare, prepare. I don't feel you can be over prepared for an interview. You know, some of the things that you might want to prepare for as we just, you know, I just mentioned in the previous, um, one of the previous slides, that a huge proportion, almost 50% of people don't have any information or know little about a company. So if you can find that out beforehand, do some research on their website, think about some things, some good questions to ask them um, about their company, then you're ahead of, you know, your competition. Um, make sure you know if it's a if it's a, a Zoom interview. Make sure that you've tested your technology beforehand. Um, make sure that you've got good bandwidth. Make sure that you've got no background noises. Um, make sure that you've got water in front of you. I also have the candidates that I'm sending to an interview have a sticky note on the side of their laptop that says "Keep smiling." Because we forget, right? We forget to keep smiling. Whereas if you keep smiling throughout the whole thing and have the reminder there, it just relaxes you. Um, if you're going to a face-to-face -face interview, it's really critical that you've figured out where you're going to beforehand. So don't leave it to that morning to figure out what bus you're catching. Make sure you've figured it out well before where you need to go to, how long it's going to take you to get there, what bus you need to take if you're catching a bus. I would rather always be half an hour early into where I need to go. I never turn up to an interview half an hour early, but turn up, you know, you find the location, know where you're going, then go for a walk for 15 or 20 minutes, catch your breath, relax, go and get a, a cup of, you know, a, a glass of water or a cup of coffee or something. Although I often suggest don't don't have a coffee before you go into an interview. It's much better to have water because often the caffeine will, caffeine will make you even more nervous. Um, but go for a walk first and just be there. You know, if you arrive five to three minutes early before your interview, I think that's a really great sign. If someone's 25 minutes early for their interview, that's a turn off for me because I, I think, hang on, our interview's not for another half an hour. You, you're obviously very keen, but you don't know how to manage your time. Mm -hmm. um, it, it puts me off because I've got to do another three things before I see you. So, you know, anywhere between that kind of three to five minute gap is perfect. Okay, so common interview questions. Tell me about yourself. That's a really hard question to answer because you don't really understand how much information they want. They're not interested in your life story. They don't want to know, you know, that your brother does this and your sister does that and that, you you know, blah, 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 blah. They want to know, you know, a, a short background of your experience, may possibly why you've studied what you've studied at university, um, any experience that you might have at the moment. So what, you know, a little bit of experience that you come with and, um, you know, where, what you want to do in the future. So I'd really focus on, you know, past, present, future for that one. Um, but make sure that you don't waffle. And and I would keep to a maximum of about two minutes. Um, and then it's also, also fine to ask the interviewer, have I answered you, your question sufficiently? 
Now, you don't want to do that at the end of every question, mm. um, but the questions that you're unsure of whether you've given too much, oh, sorry, too little information, it's better to give too little and then ask that question and then give more than to talk for too long and to waffle and then 10 minutes later you realise, you know, you're 10 minutes into the interview and you, they haven't asked the second question yet. Um, what are your strengths and your weaknesses? So, again, go back and have a look at the personality. If you're unsure of what your strengths and your weaknesses are, go back to the personality profile and that might give you some guidance. I would all, always talk about more strengths than I have weaknesses. So maybe pick, you know, three or four strengths to focus on and one weakness. Um, why, why should we hire you? Um, why do you want to work for our company? Where do you see yourself in the next three to five years? I used to interview a lot of graduates in Sydney for a fintech company, and I'd ask that question every time. Where do you see yourself in three to five years? And often they would say, I want to be the IT manager or I want to be the CIO. That's great that you're, um, you know, you aim high and you're obviously keen to succeed and, and you know, you're really keen to do well, but be conscious of who's interviewing you. So don't be telling the person that's interviewing you that you want their job in the next three to five years. And in fact, you want their boss's job in the next three to five years. It's just, it won't go down well. This is how we, we answer behavioural based questions. So behavioural based questions are situational based questions where they might ask you to describe a situation. So tell me about a time where you've had um, conflicting priorities. How have you dealt with that? OK, and this is how we answer those behavioural based questions. So we answer it to the STAR methodology. So that situation, task, action, results. So we're explaining the situation to them. We're explaining the task. We're explaining the actions and then the results. When we're answering these, it's really important that we're answering self-orientated. So in first person, they're not interested in what the team did. They're interested in your behaviour. So they want to know what you did, uh, what your accountability was in that moment, in that situation. Nailing behavioural questions. So past behaviour predicts future performance, and that's what they're getting to when they're asking you these questions. They want to know what you specifically did. So make sure you're, you're concise, you're specific. So you're talking about a specific example. You're not saying, oh, I have lots of conflicting priorities all the time, but I manage that really well by prioritising. That's not answering their behavioural question at all. OK, they want to know about, well, you know, um, I was working at McDonald's and I had someone on the front desk and I also had to see um, a situation out the back that was really pressing and urgent. You know, um, first of all, through my training, I knew that we always had to deal with customers first. So I spoke to the customer first and I dealt with that customer first. You know, I. I uh, placated that that problem and then I went out the back and I dealt with that. Um, I spoke to the team members, I updated them and then I came back and I continued on with my job. Right, so they're wanting to know specifically what you did, what your actions were. So in summary of what we've gone over today, spend time developing a resume that really highlights your skills and highlights you for the right reasons. Bring your resume alive by showcasing all of you. Look professional with a matching resume and cover letter. I would much prefer no cover letter than a cover letter that doesn't match the job or the resume. Um, you know, anything that's conflicting because you've just got a standard bulk cover letter that you throw out there with all, with your resume, it, it's a really it, it's it's a turn off for people that are assessing your resume. You only get to make a first impression once, and first impressions are key. Practice, 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 and then practice some more.
that's all. I'm keen to open up to questions and answers for, for anyone that's keen to hear more. Great. Thank you so much, Georgie. That was very informative. I learned so much myself. I was like, I was, <laughs> I was trying to um, think of, you know, my my recipe base and my cover letters, and I was wondering if I if I had followed all of this. But um, I'm at a good position now, so I, <laughs> I want to yes. see if I did. <laughs> um, so, I, of course, yeah. If any of the attendees have any questions, I've um, uh, enabled your mics, so you you can unmute yourself and ask any questions if you have some. But yeah, when when they are thinking, I actually have a question for you, Georgie, especially sure. like around like ICT jobs. Now you've spoken, mm -hmm. you've taken us through the whole process of recruitment there. But I, I just wanted to know, are there like where where to look for jobs when it comes to um, IT and ICT? Are there like any particular search engines that we should look out for? It's really interesting. Obviously, there's the common ones, Seek, Indora, um, Indeed, Jora. Um, there's a number of them. There's a hell of a lot of jobs that aren't advertised. Yes. So how do you find out those jobs? Mm. Um, I would say at Red Apple, we advertise probably maybe oh, maybe 10 percent of the jobs that we have on at any one time. We're advertising them because constantly in the background, I'm growing my network. I'm developing a network. I've, you know, um, represented thousands of people over the years so I know in my head if you know if my client comes to me and says I need a business analyst for Hobart mm -hmm. I already have three that I'll already call straight away without even advertising it because I know that those three people are looking for work because I've built a relationship with them I've built my network yeah. um, you know it costs it's expensive to advertise on seek um, and so often we don't do it um, I would really urge anyone um, joins up to TAS ICT if you're particularly interested interested in in um, the ICT industry. We had mm -hmm. a cyber conference today at Rest Point. There were 400 people in the room, including, you know, every organisation's hiring managers, IT managers, applications managers, cybersecurity managers. We're all in the room. So, if you're a familiar face to them. Um, and if you've made the effort to go along to these events, um, then they're always going to, you know, Tassie, Tassie like, likes making connections, Tasmanians like making connections, we like familiarity, we mm -hmm. like building relationships with people. Yeah. Um, so those people will always benefit, you know, and be ahead of the, ahead of the rest. Right, thank you. So yeah, that is something that I've I've been talking. Whenever I get the chance to talk to students, um, I I tell them that as well. I met a, a, a few many students in India recently, and many of them were asking what what's the kind of jobs that are available. How they yeah. keep asking the question whether it is easy or hard to find a job, and there's never a definite answer. There's but no what definite I, answer. Yeah, yeah. So what I really encourage all international students to keep in mind whether it be in Tassie or anywhere in Australia, I think keep maintaining a good network of people, um, socializing out of your own community is very important. I understand that once you're in a new country, yeah. you're obviously the first person that you speak, you want to get in connection with is someone who speaks your own language, mm -hmm. someone from your own city. And that's very important for you need to, know, to have that safety net around you. But also it's very important to branch out of your own social circles and talk to people outside of it because you never know who you'll meet in, especially in a close-knit community like Tasmania. Absolutely. And um, people are very willing to help in Tasmania mm -hmm. if, if you've made the effort as well. So, you know, absolutely build relationships with recruiters. Um, you know, there's a number of recruiters down here. There's Hayes, there's Axia Recruitment, there's Red Apple IT, there's Sis and Buck. We don't all necessarily have access to the same jobs. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really critical that you make you know, build relationships with more than one recruiter, um, mm. but then also attend networking events in Tasmania. Yeah. That would be key. And that's how I've seen a lot of international students uh, find work is through inter um, networking events, particularly TAS ICT. Right. So um, are there like any platforms where they can look look up these like networking events? Like, um, yes. Yeah. If you go to the TAS ICT website, yeah. there's mm -hmm. a... Um, there's an events and networking tab. 
Um, if you become a member of TAS ICT, I think it's about $90 for 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, then you can, you'll be sent notifications of everything um, that's happening. We have, we have about six events a year. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the cyber conference, which was on today. Um, there's TAS ICT's annual conference, which is on in November. Mm -hmm. um, there's two drinks with the Premier's events. We actually mm -hmm. had one of those last week in Launceston and one about a month ago in Hobart. Mm -hmm. um, there's various tapas and tech events throughout the year as well. So there's a whole variety on the calendar of TAS ICT events. It's quite a close-knit community and once you've mm -hmm. kind of, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to get in there, but once you're in there, you're well looked after. Right, thank you. Um, another question I had, unless anyone else has a question, please go ahead. But another question I had like, uh, are, uh, around, like, are there any like particular skills or certifications that you would recommend international students to have um, to, you know, increase their chances of becoming employable in Tasmanian IT sector? Sure. Um, I would say that the hot topics in IT at the moment are cloud, mm -hmm. cybersecurity, data and development. Mm -hmm. Those are the four key things, I think, um, and definitely the growth areas. Um, yeah, uh, we're just getting more and more work and there is going to be so much work in cyber and so much work in data. It's just really cascading. They're the areas that I see um, employers really crying out for skills. Mm -hmm. Often, you know, you may have come with a university degree or some study or some previous experience. Um, I feel like if you know what area you're keen to focus on, then yeah, possibly look at getting micro credentials in that area or look at vendor certificates, mm -hmm. you know? So if you're looking at cybersecurity, you might wanna do a, you know, um, some sort of a, a networking or help desk kind of position to get through into cybersecurity. And that's often mm -hmm. the pathway through to cybersecurity is that you've come up through, you know, service desk, um, infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, through into cyber. So, you know, um, looking at what vendors play um, and what vendors are big in those spaces um, and focusing on micro credentials from those vendors or, or you know, um, technologies. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, since you're in the in the recruitment space for all these years, you are, of course you are in touch with all the employers as well. Are you aware of uh, like any uh, particular challenges that international students face when it comes to uh, employment in the IT industry, or um, do you have any tips for them to to you know uh, come overcome those? I really feel like you know. International students come to Tasmania with an, or or come here to study at UTAS or come with a great wealth of of um, education. Mm -hmm. You know, you're highly educated. Um, you're very committed. Um, I feel like the thing that possibly may be a barrier is communication. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I often ask a lot of my students to do is instead of necessarily focusing on improving your technical skills or your certifications or your, you know, um, uh, yeah, technical skills, focus on your soft skills. Mm -hmm. So focus on, and it's really difficult, I'm sure, coming to a completely different country, learning a different language. Often, as you say, you want to connect with people, familiar people from your home. So you might you know, flat with two pe people from your home and then you find that you're talking your native language all the time. You know, I've I've got a contractor who worked in China for 20 years and she's a very senior project manager um, and she's an impressive, impressive lady. Um, but when I, I met with her over COVID, her accent was really strong. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked in Sydney for 20 years and I supplied to Optus for those 20 years and Optus is awesome in employing people that come from really diverse backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And so I got used to my ear clicking into their accents over time. So I don't tend to have a problem with accents. The accent that I have the most problem with is the Irish accent. Mm -hmm. um, but with Jessie, um, you know, her accent was very strong. Um, I could tell that she really 
would add so much value to our local economy and, and, and local industry and she needed to get work. But the thing that was letting her down was a communication. She was living at home during COVID with her husband and her daughter. They were all speaking their native language at home. So I said, OK, new rule. Every night between din at dinner time, preparing dinner and throughout dinner, you must speak English. You have to force mm -hmm. yourself. If you break that, you have to put a dollar into the jar. <laughs> OK, so you have to force yourself to speak English. Um, I also urge everyone, instead of spending, you know, half an hour or an hour every day on study, extra study, focus that on watching an Australian TV show. And I don't think you should be watching the news or current affair because it's quite formal language. I think you should be focused on things like Home and Away or mm -hmm. Rosehaven, you know. Um, Rosehaven's set in Tasmania, so it's perfect. But, you know, we speak very slowly. Mm -hmm. We speak quite broadly, um, you know, with our accents. And I think if you can slow down your speech and try and mirror your speech and try and comprehend as much as you can the English. So, you know, whether you sit down with a friend during Rosehaven or Home and Away or whatever it is that you're watching, um, Offspring's another really funny good one. Um, but then at the end of the half an hour um, episode, discuss what happened. Um, so to really understand the comprehension side of it. So I think, you know, focusing on your soft skills and your communication, your confidence is really key. Definitely. Oh, you wouldn't believe the number of um, industry experts who've come to the webinars and have suggested that um, they watch TV all, uh, all yeah, really? so, yeah. yeah, really. That's a popular, <laughs> that's almost like constant with everyone. Yeah. Um, the best way to, you know, really grab, um, uh, you know, grab your head yeah. around the slang is 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 to watch uh, Australian TV. And, and, and you know. soap operas, yes. Yeah. Soap dramas mm, and soap yeah. operas, not not so much the formal news, but the, yeah. the soap operas, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, another question, that I, probably the last one that I have, unless anyone else has any questions, is um, wh what kind of, um, who, who is an ideal candidate when it comes to, I mean, I understand that the technical requirements are different for each and every role. So what, who, who, what, kind, of, um, what kind of person is an ideal candidate for someone who wants to be employed in the Tasmanian IT sector? Anyone. <laughs> right. <laughs> Anyone, it doesn't matter. And we really are trying to promote diversity. So we want more women. Mm -hmm. We want younger people. We want more mature people. Mm -hmm. We want neurodiverse people. The benefit with technology is that, I mean, everyone uses technology. Um, and if we don't embrace diversity, we're going to program our AI mm -hmm. with our unconscious bias. Yeah. So it's really important that we embrace diversity and that we have as many people from as many different backgrounds and, you know, um, as possible so that, um, you know, we can make sure that we future proof our systems and don't um, code our bias into the AI forever. Right, right. Great. Thank you so much, Georgie. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, yes, I do have a question. Um, thank you for previous. It was really informative. And maybe you actually asked some of the questions that I wanted to ask as well. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm just wondering, um, how is the ICD industry like in Tasmania since, you know, in a couple of years, is, a couple of years ago, it was a um, skills shortage um, in throughout Australia, actually. So how is it like in, in Tasmania at the moment? It is absolutely a skill shortage here. Um, we, are, we have a very buoyant IT industry down here. And I was just um, mentioning to Nivi before the webinar, um, state growth, Tasmanian state growth recently commissioned Deloitte to do a ICT sector scan. You can go and find that online. So on LinkedIn, Maria Dalla Fontana has recently um, posted the, and I'll, I can go through and find it, Nibby, if you can't find yeah, it now. I'm, I'm actually just looking that up now. I'll share <laughs> Perfect. the, uh, I found it already. I'll share the link right. now. So, um, you know, that was a scan that was released last week, and it basically said that in 2021, um, we had a buoyant sector of $1.2 billion. That's how much the IT industry was worth to the economy of Tasmania in 2020-2021. In 
if we don't have barriers to growth through talent, through investment opportunities and through um, economic certainty, uh, uncertainty, we'll reach, we could potentially reach 3 billion by 2025, 2024, 2025. So it's a really buoyant industry, Irene. It's um, we're severely understaffed and we are trying to promote it within schools, even from a much earlier age, to try and get more engagement in technology because we, we absolutely are crying out for people. Uh, thank you for that. Um, just one last question. So at the moment, I haven't finished. Um, I'm doing master in um, UTAS. So I'm just wondering, um, because I haven't finished the study, would it have an impact if I'm looking for like a part-time job straight to the field right away or you you actually suggest it's start with placements or um, if you can get but I would say like if you can get a, an internship or if you can get a part-time job I don't think it matters if you can get any industry experience even while you're studying I think that's a good thing um and tell me did you do a bachelor of IT previously or what which which degree no, have you done previously? It's a different. Um, so I'm just trying to change a career. So I did um okay. class of IT. Yeah. Okay, so, awesome. Yeah. So uh, yeah, looking like, you know, now that you've probably got an understanding of the IT industry as well, really looking at what what you want to focus on in terms of what pathway you want to go down. Um, and as I said, potentially looking at, you know, um, micro credentials from vendors to, you know, that that kind of experience will get you, will, will um, make you more employable to those big enterprise organisations like your Hydros, TAS Networks, places like that. Yeah, sure. Thank you. No worries. Thank you, Irene. Um, do anyone else have any questions for Georgie? If there aren't any more questions, I'll I'll happily give five minutes of your day back. Um, we can wrap this up now. Thank you so much, Georgie. That was really um, very informative, and it's very encouraging that the words that you said about the industry and how we are actually looking for more talent to join us is it's a, um, yeah it's very encouraging to know that. Um, and thank you for all the tips, um, especially with the resume and the interviews. I'm sure that it'll really benefit all the students who are here. And also, since this is recorded, I hope many of them get to listen to this later as well so that'll be amazing um thank you so much for your time georgie no um, worries thank you for inviting me i appreciate it no worries thank you thank you so much and thanks to everyone who's joined us um as i mentioned this uh this whole webinar has been recorded so if you know any friends who want who have not been able to make uh make it to the live rec live session they can of course they can go on to our website maybe in a in an maybe tomorrow, I'll work on putting this up tomorrow latest. Um, on our website, on our resources page, they'll be able to find this webinar. So please share that al along with your friends. And uh, there are other uh, webinars as well. Uh, and also since Georgie was talking about improving your soft skills, I'd also like to plug in that we do a lot of webinars um, and also a few face-to-face -face interactions. We are try trying to bring that back uh, slowly to everything right from like communications and um, resilience building, how to build your confidence, time management, um, and you know, even managing your own stress and things like that. We can do a lot of employability training, but it doesn't matter if you're not having a, you know, a good, like happy study life here. So we're, we're trying to help you out. So seek, uh, seek out all the help that you can. And Study Tasmania is doing a big chunk of that as well. So please get in touch with us if you have any questions about our programs and initiatives as well. So thank you so much uh, and have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.